this evening we are going to be looking at Mark chapter 9. If you have a Bible with you or an app, I encourage you to, to open up there. To start off this evening, I, I kind of wonder what the most wonderful sight you've ever seen was. Um, there are moments that can crystallize in our memories, moments in our lives when we see something so spectacular that we're simply awestruck. We are often rendered speechless and just struck by the beauty and the gravity of what it is that we are witnessing. Maybe a time standing on a mountainside, looking over God's creation and standing in awe. Maybe just a time looking at the face of a loved one. Um, for those who are married, maybe it was, it was seeing your, your, your wife to be arrive at the church or the beach, or whatever it was you you got married to. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe, for for those of you who have done this, maybe it's the first time you looked down on the face of a newborn baby. I remember the first time I held my nephew in my arms. He was two days old at the time, and it was the day that I turned 20. It's quite an incredible thing, holding, um, holding him in my arms, seeing the hope. And the beauty of a new life. He's now a surly 15 year old, and uh, I can still pick him up, I can still hold him in my hands, but I don't tend to, and certainly <laughs> looking at him doesn't really inspire my reflections of that beauty of God anymore. Um, that's harsh, I need to apologise. <laughs> yeah, at this point, my imagination is just kind of failing me to think of beautiful things that you might have seen, but hopefully you can get. There are moments in our lives where we just stand amazed and just gaze, just awestruck and wonder eh, at the beauty of God's creation. And we're deeply and profoundly moved at what it is that we're witnessing. Often, as I say, these moments render us speechless and even now reflecting on them, we would struggle to articulate quite the beauty or the glory of what it was we witnessed. And eh, whilst we might remember it really vividly, communicating that to someone else would be difficult, um, and getting them to understand something of what it was we saw would be really challenging. This evening, we're going to be talking about one of those kind of moments in the Gospels. Uh, We're going to look at the account of the transfiguration in Mark chapter 9. Uh, And before we do that, it's worth noting that uh, there are parallel accounts in Luke 9 and Matthew 17. So if I say something that's not found in Mark 9, odds are it came from you know, Luke or Matthew. I'm trying to highlight when I'm, when I'm doing that, but either it's probably from one of those two accounts. If not, I made that up and, and I'm in trouble. Um, let's read Mark 9, verses 2 to 13 together. <clears throat> Mark chapter 9, starting at verse 2. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, and he led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out from the cloud, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one of what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, Why did the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how it is written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt. But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. 
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we turn to open up your word this evening, we ask you for your help. Lord, we ask you for your help to understand, your help to see something of the beauty that the, the disciples saw, your help to see something of the glory of Christ. And Lord, we just ask that you would be at work in us this evening, be at work in this place, be glorified in this place as we lift our eyes to you. Help us this evening, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So as you probably know, if you've been paying attention, if tonight's not your first night, we've been doing a series in Mark's Gospel. Um, and we have seen Mark's Gospel kind of broadly split into two halves. The first half seeks to establish the identity of Christ and his authority. And so we've seen demonstrations of Christ's power and authority to teach it. Time and time again, he's travelling around, teaching people and teaching with authority. We've seen examples of his power and authority over sickness. Again, people being brought time and time again to Christ, asking him for healing and receiving healing from him. We've seen examples of his power and authority over nature, the calming of the storms that we've seen. We've seen his power and authority over death. The healing of Jesus' daughter. Um, and we've seen his power and authority over sin. The healing of the lame man. The man to whom he says, your sins are forgiven. The first half really ends, as we saw last week, with Peter's confession in Mark 8, verse 29. You are the Christ. And then the second half of Mark's Gospel is very much about Jesus moving towards the cross. Um, we saw that last week. The second half begins with Jesus foretelling his death and his resurrection. And we'll see in that again this week um, as Christ, at least we reference to him as a coming down the mountain. Um, and the disciples still don't understand really what Christ means by that. So the immediate context of our passage then is that Peter has confessed Christ. He said, you are the Christ. And having had his eyes opened, or at least had his, had his eyes opened in part, eh, he's then rebuked by Christ because he tries to rebuke Christ. Um, and eh, yeah, Mark is then oddly specific about the length of time between what, between that happening and the events of our passage. Mark records that it's six days from Jesus rebuking Peter. To Jesus in taking Peter, James and John up the mountainside. Often in the Gospels we see Jesus pull this kind of core group out of his disciples and they then witness some of the pinnacle events um, for whatever reason that the others don't witness. Um, we saw with the healing of Jesus' daughter for example uh, in Mark 5 verse 37 Jesus kind of pulls uh, this group together, he doesn't allow anyone else to follow him except Peter, James and John. We'll see it again in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, in Mark chapter 14 where Jesus would tell his disciples to sit here a while and then take Peter, James and John uh, from the group and, and uh, pray with them or ask them to pray for him. I think it's fair to say that Jesus is investing in these three in a significant way. He obviously has 12 apostles, but then he has this kind of core three um, from within that 12 that he's specifically you know, investing in and spending time with and kind of revealing more of himself to these three. Anyway, <clears throat> it's these three that set up, off, set off up the mountain with Christ. And Luke tells us in his account that they went there to pray. And so as they were praying, Jesus is transfigured before them. The Greek word there for transfigured is the word that we use, that we get metamorphosis from. Um, I'm not going to try and pronounce it, but it's the, it's the kind of word that we, we get metamorphosis from. Um, and so it's that kind of change, that kind of complete change of himself that's going on here. Anyway, um, Jesus undergoes this change. Uh, and the, the gospel writers are 
clearly, really struggling to describe adequately what's going on. In the Bible, whenever we see something of the glory of God revealed, the language is very much about kind of brightness, the kind of purity, the kind of whiteness that of what's being seen. There are no words that would or could adequately encapsulate the glory of God being displayed. So where we see this kind of language is very much an accommodation to us and we're left trying to picture something of an unapproachable, indescribable radiance. Um, and I'm now trying to use words to describe something the words can describe. So we're going to move on. Um, but we see here Christ taking back on and revealing something of his glory that he laid aside at the Incarnation. I say something of his glory because I think that if he had been in his full glory, then the disciples just wouldn't have been able to stand up. They would have had to flee from his presence or would have been consumed themselves. They wouldn't be able to stand in the presence of Christ and his full glory because he's, because he's so, so holy. So verse 4, having transfigured, Jesus is then joined by Moses and Elijah and they have a conversation. Again, Luke's account tells us that the three were talking about the departure of Christ or literally the exodus of Christ. There are two things that are hugely significant and I don't want us to miss them about this verse. Firstly, look at the people that join Jesus. Moses and Elijah. I'm kind of curious as to how they knew it was Moses and Elijah because they've never seen them before. But presumably they must have asked or been identified or worn name tags or something like that. I like to think maybe they played a game of charades where Moses and Elijah just acted out some of their greatest hits. Um, and, and, and Peter James enjoyed that, I guess. But I don't know. That's what I like to think of anyway. I'm good. Hey, hey. The commentator suggests that it's massively significant that it was these two individuals. Moses was there to represent the law of God. Law of God. Having written the Torah, having written the books of the law, Moses was there. Then Elijah, a prophet of God, one who looked and foresaw the coming of the Messiah and called the people back to God. And here these two join Christ, the one who would fulfill the law perfectly and the one about whom all the prophecies were given. Also, both Moses and Elijah have Curious deaths recorded. Moses died right on the edge of the promised land. He led this exodus out of Egypt and he died right on the edge of the promised land. Elijah was taken up and didn't actually die, he was taken up. Um, and so here these guys are discussing with Christ his departure, his exodus. Christ whose death will begin, it will be the beginning of a new exodus. An exodus for those who would believe in him. As we see in Exodus, the book, eh, there's a sacrificial lamb that's slaughtered and the Israelites take refuge under the blood by marking their doorposts. And, and kind of the angel of death then moves through, through Egypt, killing the firstborn and then... Eh, at that point, Pharaoh relents and, and lets his, his slaves go. Here is Jesus, the new sacrificial lamb, the better sacrificial lamb, whose blood covers over those who are in Christ and brings the believers out of their slavery to the world and into the family of God. The imagery here and the implications here are hugely significant. And, and, and there are massive allusions to the Old Testament. But also Christ himself will be taken up following his resurrection. In the same way that Elijah was taken up, so Christ will be taken up, which is recorded in, in Acts 1. So verses, verses 5 and 6. So standing, watching this happen, and listening to 
this conversation, Peter, James and John have absolutely no idea what to say. So Peter steps up, and you just know that this is going to be classic. <laughs> he opens his mouth and he lets his belly run uh, And the, apo- the apostles are terrifying, to be fair. And as we see, time and time again, when you encounter, when people encounter something of the glory of God, their instinctive reaction isn't to tend towards worship or towards praise, but it's instead to move towards fear. The most common, the most repeated commandment in the Bible is do not fear, because people are afraid of the glory of God. Because the, the glory of God, they realise how holy and how set apart God is, and how sinful and how fallen they are. Come face to face with a stark contrast, and it produces fear. I don't really know what to make of Peter's suggestion to put up tents in verse 5. All I can really think to say is that at least he enjoyed the field trip that he took with Jesus. Right, so he basically says, Jesus, good field trip. We get a five out of five on TripAdvisor. Let me bump up some tents for you guys. And you just think, Peter, come on, just go and not. It's a very worldly suggestion because he just doesn't know what to do in that situation and just doesn't know what to say in that situation. And to be fair to Peter, he gets a lot of stuff, but to be fair to him, I don't think any of us would have done any better in that situation. Peter is interrupted by the voice of God in verse 7. In the Old Testament, a cloud so often signifies the presence of God. And we see the same thing here. They are overshadowed by a cloud and they hear the voice of God. And something about the people we saw in chapter 1, God testifies, This is my son. Then he issues a commandment to Peter, James, and John Listen to him. This, this testimony of God is slightly different from the one in chapter 1. Because the one in chapter 1 is about Christ. In chapter 1, in chapter one God says, This is my son with whom I am well pleased. Here, he says, This is my son. Listen to him. So it's a slightly different um, commandment. Or it's a slightly different utterance of God. I think if there's one thing to us, for us to understand from this again, it's surely this. This is Jesus, the Son of God. Look to him, listen to him. So literally what God tells the disciples to do, it's literally what we need to do. Verse 8, having heard the command of God, the apostles realise that Moses and Elijah have gone and are left with Jesus only. Spurgeon remarks how blessed they were that Christ remained rather than Moses or Elijah. As Spurgeon says, I'm happy indeed would they have been if they had looked about and seen none but Moses, for poor comfort could Moses bring. Or if looking around they had seen none but Elias, for the stern prophet of fire would have been but poor consolation to them in their life struggles. But Moses may go and Elijah may go, lawgiver and prophet may vanish, as long as Jesus Christ remains and is enough. Jesus only is enough for all our wants, for all our desires. The reality is that while the law is good, it isn't capable of dealing with the problem of our hearts, the problem of our sin. Only Christ can do that. Only looking to Christ and his glory on set our eyes and our hearts on him alone can deal with the problem of our sin. We can deal with the problem of our, of our hearts. While Elijah could look forward to the day that God would fulfill his promises, how much sweeter it is that that day that Christ is here, that he is with his apostles now, and heading towards Jerusalem, where he would give his life for the sacrifice.
salvation of all who would believe in him. Verse 9, following the transfiguration and following this great revelation of Christ in something of his glory, Christ tells Peter, James and John not to speak of this until after his resurrection from the dead. We've seen elements of what's called the messianic secrecy that play in Mark's gospel. Um, that's where Jesus tells people, don't tell, don't tell, don't tell anyone what's happened. He's telling them not to, not to speak about things. We've seen elements of that before. But here Christ tells them, don't speak about this until after the resurrection. Again, Christ's eyes are going forward here. And his face is very much turned towards Jerusalem and his coming death and resurrection. In verses 10 to 13, again we see the disciples don't understand. And rather than ask, they shift the topic to Elijah. I don't really know quite why they're talking about Elijah, um, other than perhaps because they've just seen Elijah. That would make sense. Um, we're not really told, and so I guess it doesn't really matter why they decide to chat about Elijah just now. But the question comes from the teaching of the scribes, and it's based on a verse in Malachi, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, which says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So the apostles want to know. How can the day of the Lord come without Elijah having returned? Christ answers this question by saying that Elijah has in fact come and is in the person of John the Baptist, eh, which Matthew makes explicit in his account. Following these events, they come down the mountain and are greeted by a crowd. Eh, and Jesus drives out an unclean spirit from a boy. We're not really going to talk about that at length, except to observe that in verse 15, the crowd saw Jesus. They were greatly amazed and ran towards him to greet him. Again, Spurgeon argues that pro the probability is that Christ's face was still shining like the face of Moses when he came down the mountain in Exodus 34. But where the Israelite fled from Moses, who then had to reveal his face, um, instead with Christ, rather than be repelled from his radiance, people are drawn towards him and running towards him. Spurgeon says, the glory of Christ attracts, whereas the glory of Moses repels. The glory of the law is terrible, but the glory of the gospel is cheering and attractive. So what are we to make of this? And how is it to impact on our lives? Well, if you're anything like me, then you'll be drawn towards judging your Christianity based on a battle with your sin or a particular set of sins. And when you're winning that battle, when you're walking in victory, then your Christianity is going brilliant. You're a good Christian. It's all great. But then when you're struggling and falling, you feel like you're an awful Christian. If you're even a Christian at all. You don't get me wrong what I'm about to say because there's something about that, there's something important there, there's something necessary about getting people to draw alongside you and walk with you in that. But that way of thinking is based on the law is not based on the gospel. Being a Christian is about having a relationship with Christ, fixing your eyes upon him, fixing your eyes upon his glory. We're inclined to navel gaze, to look at ourselves, but we should be looking at the glory of Christ as it's revealed to us. We should be lifting our eyes to the glory of Christ, not looking at ourselves. The glory of the gospel attracts us. It doesn't drive us away. The law pushes us away because we can never measure up to it. But the glory of the gospel draws us near to Christ because it covers our sins by his blood. 
So when we slip up, because we've well sin, we need to remember that the gospel draws us near. It doesn't push us away. We're invited to come back to Christ time and time again to receive grace upon grace upon grace. So this week, when you sin, Remember that the gospel attracts. Remember that his arms are open. You need to come back to him. Don't flee. Come back to him. The gospel calls you beloved members of his his family. You're a beloved member of the family of Christ. The gospel draws us near. Fix your eyes anew on Christ. On his glory. Take the example of the Father in Mark 9. I know we've not read it, but it's there. Take the example of the Father in Mark 9. Say to Christ that you believe and ask him to help you in your unbelief. Here, Peter, James, and John saw something of the glory of God. We will see the full glory of Christ with you. And when we do, we'll not be able to take our eyes off him. Jesus has turned his face towards Jerusalem. He's heading towards the cross. He's preparing himself to give his life to start this new exodus. This freedom of his people from the slavery to the world. And to bring his people into his family. That's what Jesus is heading towards. That's what his face is set toward. And that is where our hope is found. That is where we need to put our trust. Up the mountain, only Jesus remained. Because Jesus was all we needed. Our lives are different now. Because we're no longer bound to the law. While waiting on the fulfilment of promises, Jesus has done it. He's freed us from the law. He has fulfilled the promises. And so we fix our eyes on Christ and on Christ alone. Because the commandment of God was to listen to him. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the glory of Christ revealed to us in your word. We give you thanks that we can set our eyes upon him. We give you thanks that the gospel of tract doesn't push us away. You do not reject us when we sin, when we fail, when we fall, when we stumble. You draw us and you call us your beloved. You have made us members of your family. So Lord, we pray and we ask that you would help us. Help us to set our eyes upon Christ. Help us to keep our eyes on the glory of Christ. Help us to lift our heads up, Lord. Help us to see that the Father in this in, in Mark 9 Lord I believe help me in my unbelief be with us Lord we 